Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week we're gonna talk about how to cut some bow tie inlays, how to inlay those inlays. We'll talk about what glue to use. More importantly, we'll talk about what glue not to use. We will even talk about which cracks probably do need a bow tie and which ones are probably fine on their own. Stay tuned. The most common question I get when it comes to these bow ties is, what exactly do they do? And this isn't gonna be the most satisfying answer to a lot of you out there, but they don't always do anything. A lot of times they just are there for looks. And some people love the look of bow ties. I really like them. I think they're cool, but some people despise the look of bow ties. And so you couldn't imagine putting them in there just for looks because they look like a Frankenstein stitch up the side of an otherwise pretty piece of wood. And I actually totally get that. The first ones that we're gonna be showing here are really just for looks. You can see it's a large crack, it's pretty stable, it's filled with resin, so it's not probably gonna crack anymore. So these ones are just to give that kind of handcrafted Nakashima look. And if you don't know Nakashima, and I'm probably saying that name wrong, he kind of pioneered or invented this bow tie look back I think in the 50s and 60s and made some really, really beautiful live edge tables before anybody did live edge tables. So I'm kind of copying his look with these bow ties that are really there just for looks. I have a full build video on this desk that I made a couple of weeks ago, and I got a couple of comments from people that said, hey, you really should have saved those offcuts and made your bow ties out of them because the wood that you chose really doesn't match the slab. And this actually is an offcut from that slab, so this wood matches as close as any wood possibly could. Although there is a good bit of variation in color and grain from one end of this slab to the other. That said, you don't have to use wood that matches. I wouldn't use wood from a different walnut slab in a different walnut table. However, I would use something like a really light contrasting maple wood in a walnut slab, or I've even done brass bow ties. There's all kinds of inlays you can do and nothing says it has to match perfectly. Even though these particular bow ties are mostly for looks, I do recommend using essentially straight grained wood and it can have some figure in it. The figure isn't ideal as far as strength goes, but I wouldn't recommend using something like a burl wood or where the grain is really running across it. Generally, you want the grain to start from one end and run all the way through the tip of the other end. I'm gonna show you how I cut my bow ties using a really simple jig for my bandsaw. And this isn't a jig that I created. I did make a YouTube video on it though. Although it's only like three cuts, so I'm not sure it merits a whole YouTube video. If you wanna check that out though, I'll leave a link in the description below. Essentially, all you do is you take your little wood rectangles there, you find the exact center, and I'll give you guys a tip when you're finding the center of these, use millimeters, because I can tell you, and the Europeans are gonna love this, it is much easier to find half of 112 millimeters than it is to find half of one and 564 or something like that. So find the center, mark the center, make the cut right up to it or maybe just short of it on your bandsaw. And then that'll leave just those little nubs there that you can clean up with a chisel. And if you find yourself doing what I'm doing here, cutting a bunch of bow ties that are essentially the same size, before you get any further, I highly recommend numbering each bow tie individually because even though they look the same, there's gonna be little micro variations that are gonna really cause either one of these bow ties to either fit too loosely in the other one's hole or too tightly in that hole. And also get your head out of the gutter. That is a horrible thing to think, but number your bow ties individually so you don't get them confused. I didn't really mention it at the start of the video, but you saw me cut a bunch of pieces of paper that were roughly the sizes of these bow ties. And I just played around with them until I found a layout that I liked. And I personally like the look of these pairs of bow ties. And there's nothing to say that you need to do this. This is just a look that I like. And it's something I found by really just laying out the paper and seeing what looked good to me. I probably don't have to say this, but if we number our bow ties and we don't number the slab, it doesn't really do us any good if we don't know which bow tie goes where. So make sure you put a little mark on the slab and on the bow tie. Now all I am really doing is just tracing the outline of each individual bow tie with my marking knife. And if you don't have a marking knife, do yourself a favor, spend about 20 bucks, get yourself a good Japanese marking knife. It doesn't have to be a super fancy one. You can use an X-Acto knife and they work really well for about 30 seconds and then the blade is spent and you have to replace it. Whereas this marking knife, I will go through many, many bow ties before I even think about sharpening it. I prefer these Japanese ones. You don't have to use this particular style. You can get a Western style or whatever you like just get yourself a decent marking knife. And I'll give you a little tip when it comes to using this. 
make several light shallow passes instead of some heavy passes. And the reason for that is it's easy to kind of shift that bow tie in that double side tape. And if you make just light pass, light pass, light pass, it is a much, much cleaner line that won't shift your bow tie around. The next thing we need to do is we need to hog out the material from the center of the inlay. And I've seen this done a number of different ways. However, I really only like this particular method. And that is to use a straight bit on a plunge router. I've seen people that use chisels. I've seen people that will hog it out with just a drill. I don't think there's anything easier or more accurate than using a plunge router and a spiral bit. And this is a perfect bit in my opinion. It's a quarter inch spiral upcut bit. I'll link this in the description below. I'll link pretty much everything in this video except for this router because I actually hate this router. It's just not a very well-built router. The plunge function is awful. I have two of them though and I'm stuck with them. So don't buy this particular Bosch plunge cut router. I do like their smaller Bosch router and the reason I don't use my Festool router is because of its dust extraction it actually piles all of the dust up in the center so you can't see what you're doing. So. This is one of the reasons why guys like me have so many different routers. I get a lot of people that ask me, why don't I use something like a bow tie jig? Because they're really inexpensive, they're really fast, and they're pretty accurate. Or why don't you use a Shaper Origin because it's you know essentially a handheld CNC machine. This could do all the work for me in a fraction of the time. And a lot of you are probably thinking it's the craftsman in me and I wouldn't lower myself to have a machine do the work for me. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I love anything that can do the job the best way possible. The reason I don't like those ones is because to use a jig or a router, they leave rounded corners on the edges and I just don't like the look of it. And it's as simple as that. It's If I had a quicker, better way to do these, I would absolutely do it. I do this because I like the sharp corners on the edges and that's just the only way that I know how to do it is to cut them by hand. So there's nothing wrong if you wanna use one of those jigs or if you wanna use your shaper or a big CNC, and you'd like the look of those, by all means use that. It does not mean you're any worse of a woodworker. It also doesn't mean you're a better woodworker, but in my opinion, it doesn't take anything away from the project. If you haven't done inlay work before, and I've talked about this a little bit in some past videos, it really shouldn't be as intimidating, at least as it was to me before I ever tried it, because essentially all you do is you trace your object and then you carve out the center. And to do that, you really need two things. First thing, you need some sharp chisels, and that doesn't mean expensive chisels, and yes, I have some super expensive chisels. That's an unbranded Japanese one. I don't have a link for it, unfortunately. These are blue spruce, and they're like 70, 80 bucks a piece, which is pretty expensive for a chisel. So yes, I have expensive chisels. They will hold an edge a little bit longer, but they won't cut it any cleaner. So if you can get a good edge on your DeWalt chisels or your Buck Bros or your grandpa's chisels, that's all it really takes. And after you have some sharp chisels, after that, it just takes patience. And that's really the hardest part because you can watch a lot of YouTube videos on how to get a sharp edge, but there are no videos on how to be more patient or at least no videos that I think would actually work. So the advice I can give you though is to take as little off as possible. You wanna take about half the distance between your gap and your marking knife line until you have no choice but to just kinda of click that chisel into the line and take that last little bit off. And the problem that you'll have is when you try to take too big of a bite because then you'll compress the fibers and leave a big gap that's gonna need to be filled with like a epoxy or wood dust and glue. And that's just gonna make it look not quite as sharp or as clean. After you get done with the chisel work, this is about how they should look. All the lines are really pretty straight. The bottom generally aren't super pretty, but what matters is what is up on top. And if you do have any little dings or areas that you compressed, we're gonna be able to touch those up with the next step. But first, we just really need to make sure those bow ties are gonna fit. So I give them a little bit of a kind of a test fit where you just barely squeeze them in there and then do any additional cleanup from there. This old worn out rigid sander delivers a horrible sanding pattern. It squeals, the pad is worn out. I keep it around for one reason, and that is it's the only sander I currently have that has a bag attached to it. So when I need to make these really suspicious baggies of sanding dust, this is my go-to sander. And I like to keep some white oak, some maple, some elm, some walnut, just kind of a good cross section of different colors. And you'll see what I'm gonna do with those in just a little bit. Before we just pound these bow ties in, we need to add a slight chamfer to the underside. And this is gonna accomplish a couple things. 
The first thing is it's gonna help line it up. So when we start to press this bow tie in, it's not gonna go in crooked and get stuck because we really only have one shot at this. And if we get it going in crooked, we might not be able to get it out and then we're gonna be in a really bad way. And you can accomplish this chamfer a couple different ways. The first way that I like to do it when I'm making a video, I get my prettiest chisel, I get it super sharp, I get the camera really close, I get that nice blurry background, and I just make these really satisfying slicing videos where I cut that chamfer. And this takes me, you know, about five minutes per bow tie. However, if I'm not making a YouTube video, this is my go-to method where I take about, I don't know, five to 10 seconds per bow tie, use my sander here and accomplish the exact same thing. I'll talk about the glue you don't wanna use in a little bit, but first the glue that I do like to use, and this is just regular Tight Bond Original. You could also use Tight Bond 2 or 3. I think any of those would work just fine for an inlay. And there's some really good reasons on these adhesives you don't wanna use, so stick around for that in just a little bit. Also, don't just hit these with a hammer. I've made that mistake before and I've actually cracked these, and you really don't wanna to try to fish one of these out once they are already all the way in. And here's what we're doing with that wood dust is I like to get a mix of kind of a medium and a dark. So I have my walnut and the white oak there and I kind of blend them together because what I found if I only used walnut, you'd get kind of that dark line around the perimeter that doesn't really match the variation in the grain color. So if you mix up the colors, it kind of matches that natural variation in the walnut that you see there. I should mention that if we did a good job with our chisels, we won't have a solid line of wood glue and dust around the perimeter. It's just gonna fill in those tiny, tiny little imperfections. And here I had to get a little bit creative because I had the epoxy portion and the wood portion. So what I came up with here was using a little bit of epoxy where the wood met the epoxy crack that I'd filled right there. And then I used wood glue for the rest of it. And I'll explain a little bit more on why I didn't just use epoxy for the whole thing in just a minute or two. At this point, I've shown you about two thirds of everything I know about inlaying wood, which is kind of sad that I've been able to do that in only 12 minutes. However, if you have enjoyed what you've seen so far, if you think you've learned something, if you think that I've earned your subscription, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button right now. It does make a big difference since YouTube is now my job. This is how we keep score. This is how I'm able to get sponsors. So if you think that I've earned it, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button right now. If you don't think that I've earned it yet, stick around to the end. And if I can change your mind, great. If not, I just appreciate the view. I've tried flattening these inlays a number of different ways. And lately this has been my go-to. And I don't know that I'm not gonna be able to come up with a better method than this, but right now it works pretty well. And this is just a little block plane that I have set kind of medium aggressive. And I like this method because there's no risk of dinging the table. Whereas if I use a belt sander and you get it just a little bit off center, you can put a big gouge in your table. And this takes a little while. The block plane gets pretty warm, but it is a nice safe method and it makes for a good satisfying video. After I get the block plane about as close as I can get it, I move on to the sander with 100 grit. And the only thing you really need to know here is you need to use a really firm pad. If you use a soft pad or even a medium pad, you're really gonna kind of round over the tops of your inlay and it won't be really flat or smooth. Next thing I wanna talk about though is when do we need a bow tie? Do you always need them? When should we put them maybe on the underside? And that's what we're gonna talk about right here. This is the same desk, but this is the underside and that is a really small crack. And even though it's small, it might be even worse than the big one because that crack went all the way through from the top to the bottom and I was able to fill it cosmetically with CA glue, but I wasn't really able to stop the crack from potentially moving even further. So what I'm doing here is I'm gonna be doing these inlays on the underside. And so these are just purely functional bow ties, just kind of ugly little stubby ones. And I'm gonna inlay them essentially the exact same way. I am gonna use epoxy instead of wood glue and I'll talk about that here in just a second. I wanted to show you what happens when you get a little bit too aggressive with the chisel. And right here, I tried to take a little bit too much and you can see that I compressed the fibers and it doesn't look great. And yes, we can repair it. Yes, we can fill it with either epoxy or the wood glue and dust, but never gonna look as good. It's just a perfect wood fit inlay. Also earlier I said, don't use epoxy on your inlays. And here I'm obviously using epoxy. Why am I doing that? Epoxy works great functionally, it just doesn't look very good. And since these are on the underside, it's gonna do a great job of holding them in there. It's just gonna leave kind of a dark little perimeter around the edge that looks really bad and I would never 
ever do it on the top of a table because I've done it on the tops of tables and it looks horrible and I've had to put a new inlay over the old inlay. So don't use epoxy for an inlay you're actually gonna see, but it does work great functionally. I feel like I still might not have been clear enough on why I don't recommend using epoxy and I tried to capture it with the video and I didn't do a great job. So I have a couple different examples. One is from this desk and I have a future build coming up that I'll show you a little better clip of why you don't wanna use epoxy with something like this. And if you look closely, you can just see, even if it is an absolutely perfect fit, you still get that dark perimeter all the way around the outside. And here is a Myrtle one I'm working on. And this was just a horrible one. This is embarrassing. I ended up redoing it used wood glue and that is how it looks. So definitely go for the wood glue over epoxy anytime you're actually gonna see it. Also, if you want a little bit more on this Myrtle table or you wanna see the entire desk build of this insane Bastone Walnut slab, I will have links to both those videos in the description below, although the Myrtle one won't be out for another week or two. Also, I like to give a little bit of credit to people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, let me know whether you like these DIY videos, the how-tos, or you wanna see more build videos. So start your comment with either DIY, build, or both, and that way I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video, and I promise I will answer all of your questions and comments first. As always, thank you so much. Have a great week.